All right, welcome everybody. Um, and welcome everyone who's online and uh, participating virtually. My name is Usman Power Green. Um, I'm an associate professor in the history department uh, and director of Africana Studies. And I am absolutely delighted to join my colleagues here on stage for, for what I imagine will be a fantastic presentations uh, and then hopefully wonderful conversation with those of you in the audience. Um, and those of you who are virtual, feel free. Hopefully the URL uh, or any information you need will be made available so you can type your questions in. Uh, and uh, we will try to integrate those into uh, the questions that, that we have. Um, this panel's effort is to explore my colleagues' research on race, gender, and ethnicity, um, and to facilitate a discussion that highlights their recent work. Um, and let me introduce you to, to our panelists. So, so first, actually, it's not, oh, no, it is an order. Wonderful. Uh, beside me is Christina Wilson, who's a professor of art history. Um, professor Wilson most recently authored Mid-Century Modernism and the American Body, Race, Gender, and the Politics of Power in Design. She is also the author of two award-winning books, The Modern Eye, Stinglitz, did I get close? Stieglitz, thank you. Uh, Mom Momo and the Art of, of the Exhibition, which won the Eldridge Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in American Art in 2011 and Livable Modernism, Interior Decorating and Design During the Great Depression, 2004, uh, which received the Charles Montgomery Book Award from the Decorative Art Society. Professor Wilson co-curated the 2016 Worcester Art Museum e exhibition. So I, I didn't practice these, obviously. <laughs> these titles of these wonderful works that I do not know. Um, Sinotypes, Sinotypes? Photography's Blue Period, which won an award for excellence from the Association of Art Museum Curators. She has also written numerous articles for journals and exhibition catalogs on subjects relating to design, painting, and museum history in the 20th century America. To her left, Professor Parminder Bachu, Professor of Sociology here in Clark, and also my next door neighbor, so I get a chance to to read her, her door and, and her, the brilliant quotes and authors who she brings to Clark. Um, Parmenda Bachu uh, studies the complex movements of people across international borders and examines their cultural and technical creativity and what makes them particularly adept at navigating uncertainty in fragile worlds. She is the author of Movers and Makers, Resilience, Uncertainty, and Migrant Creativity in Worlds of Flux, Twice Migrants and Dangerous Designs, as well as co-editor of Enterprising Women and the Immigration and Global Processes for nine years, um, oh, I'm sorry, Immigration and Entrepreneurship. At Clark, she was the Henry Luce Professor in Cultural Identities, here it is, and Global Processes for nine years, and director of the Women's Studies Program. Professor Bachu is a multiple migrant maker who has lived in four continents, East Africa, the United Kingdom, Asia, and on both sides of the East and West coasts of the United States. And finally, to her left, Professor Anita Fabos, Professor and Associate Director and International Development, Community and Environment uh, Departments here at Clark. As an anthropologist, Professor Fabos has integrated teaching, research, and participatory programs that have incorporated refugee and forced migrant perspectives into collaborative work with scholars, practitioners, refu or refugee organizations, policymakers, and international organizations. At Clark, she coordinates the IDCE graduate concentration and the Certificate in Refugees, Forced Migration and Belonging. Clark Scholar at Risk Chapter, and, and she is the co-convener co of the new integration and be belonging hub. Students in our classes have carried out community-based projects to investigate refugee participation in community development initiatives, refugee access to higher education, refugee livelihoods in Worcester, and experiences of belonging and home for people from refugee and non-refugee backgrounds. 
Professor Fabos has worked and conducted research together with Muslim, Arab, Sudanese in the diaspora on transnational identity and mobility in the Middle East, Europe, and North America. So the plan is for um, uh, Professor Christina Wilson to give a presentation first, um, and then uh, uh, Parmender will go second. And um, Professor Fabos and myself will engage in conversation. Hopefully, you all will also uh, uh, participate in that conversation. So let's start off with Christina. Professor Wilson, thank you. Round of applause, Professor Wilson. All right. Okay, thank you, Usman, for that uh, lovely uh, introduction. And it's really exciting to see all of you here in person and um, the audience online. And it's so exciting to be here with my colleagues. Uh, so what I thought I would do this afternoon, morning, uh, is to talk a little bit very briefly about my recent book. And um, so I'm just starting off with a few images of the cover of the book and the uh, title, the, the title pages for each of the chapters. And what I wanted to do is just prioritize a few sort of comments about how I was thinking about race and gender in this work. Uh, so one of the things that I, one of the ways that I think about design and design history is uh, approaching it from the question of how design can be a tool for self fashioning and self presentation. And I've always been very interested in how design works as a tool of power. So whose bodies are allowed to be comfortable in objects, whose bodies are on display, uh, whose bodies are allowed to be seen at all in certain designs. And so actually just even looking at some of the images on the screen here, um, you know, that the, the man in the sofa is the one who's actually comfortable. And the woman uh, that he's looking at is on on display as the sofa that he's sitting on is on display. And then the woman here in the lower image on the bubble sofa is also very much on display. And the woman stepping through the frame of this very famous modernist chair, the chair is on display, she's on display, although she's toppling over the chair. So maybe there's a nice little sort of power statement about how uncomfortable this chair really is um, going on. So anyway, so these are the kinds of questions that I'm interested in and I'm thinking about. Um, and so when I began working on this project, what I wanted to really interrogate is how these objects that might be, um, how the objects that are designed in the mid-century decades, um, how they're involved in discourses of power, particularly around the construction of identity as it's um, indexed around race and gender. The standard story of mid-century modernism and mid-century modernist design. Um, and this is both those of us who are in the professional world of design history, but also I think the world at large as we all consume, for example, Mad Men or I don't know, the newest iteration of the Restoration Hardware Catalog or you know, any of the ways that mid-century modernism kind of regurgitates itself through our consumer discourse. Um, the, the story is that the mid-century decades were finally the moment when modern design became popular for quote-unquote everyone because designers like the Eameses, and perhaps this is a name that you're familiar with, sort of Eames design, um, that the Eameses achieved elegant designs that could be mass-produced, and so suddenly everybody started buying it. Um, but this is a glossy story that overlooks some very messy realities. It assumes that affordability is, first of all, the only thing that matters, as if people don't buy expensive items as a long-term investment for their homes. Um, secondly, it prioritizes aesthetics and thinks less about actual physical bodily comfort. And if you've ever sat in any of the molded plywood Eames chairs, you know that those are actually not very comfortable, um, but they were very affordable. Um, and then thirdly, this is a history that puts at its center the designers who had the industry works to make mass production possible. And at the time, those were the designers who were predominantly white men. So I realized that this glossy story is very much a story that reinforces whiteness, and I really wanted to delve into that. 
This book that I've written here is it was really about that pursuit. I basically realized that I had not noticed some of the ways that this design operates to reinforce whiteness because I myself am a white scholar. And so the book is a layered account of how I approached this question of race in design. Uh, and I will say that um, the, my, uh, one of my, um, one of the ways that I really kind of got into this topic is very much indebted to my life here at Clark and uh, a, a wonderful class that I got to co-teach with my colleague, Deb Martin, who's here in the audience. Um, and so, you know, it's this sort of life of, uh, of cross-disciplinary collaborations and conversation that we get to have here at this university um, that is how this project came into being. Um, so in the book, I look at how modern design was marketed to audiences in the decades after World War II. Uh, but I also look at the designers and the practitioners of modernism and pay attention to how they talk about modernism. So for example, in chapter three, which is actually the first chapter that I worked on, but you know that's how sort of books go, um, I did a lot of research on the Herman Miller Furniture Company which is one of the major furniture makers um, still operating in the United States today. Uh, and their design director in the mid decades of the 20th century was George Nelson. And so I was interested in how on the one hand, Nelson designed showrooms and advertisements that included these isolated objects from non-Western cultures. So you can see like in this um, uh, bookcase here on the left, and then in the advertisement, that mask there um, that's floating in the upper left corner. These are actually examples of tourist art that he's picking up in places, but he's bringing them back and sort of throwing them into sort of samples and corners of his showrooms and then into the advertisements as these exotic curios. And what they do is they set, and they're not for sale, they're, this, they're just there to basically set off the rationality and modernity and whiteness of his own designs. I was also struck by the fact that many of his chairs and sofas, such as the marshmallow sofa, that bubble sofa there that you're seeing in those two photos, um, that they're actually not comfortable at all to sit on. Um, and then they were often illustrated with women on them, the object of tantalizing half views, often seen from behind. And indeed, when Nelson wrote a book about chairs, he was a prolific writer. He wrote a book about chairs in 1952. And he said that in the new open floor plans of like the suburban ranches of suburbia, um, chairs now, you, know, you couldn't put them against the wall because there were no walls. And so they now had to stand out and had to have curves that were as interesting as a girl in a bikini suit, which is why I titled the chapter Like a Girl in a Bikini Suit. Um, and the photograph that opened this book about chairs was that photo of the nude woman sitting very uncomfortably, I would add, on a chair. Uh, so these are designs that control women, white women, by putting them on view in very uncomfortable chairs for men to gaze at. So I was interested in George Nelson as a writer, um, and so I turned to him, and then I actually assembled a collection of authors representing a variety of positionalities um, uh, in my investigation in chapter one, where I looked at five advice books on interior decorating and house design that were published between 1945 and 51. And basically, these are all books that are written in anticipation of what's going to be, everyone knows there's going to be this huge post war uh, housing boom um, after World War II. And I was interested in the voices of modernists, designers and architects, and I wanted to just see, I wanted to explore how they talked about modernism, how they sold it to their reading public. And there's a lot of judgment evident in all of these texts, but there are some interesting themes. So all of the authors describe the house as a place that governs the body. And it's especially a site of labor for the woman of the house. They all presume that the house is a heteronormative place. Uh, the white authors in this group, which are represented by um, most of the photos here. So the two, um, the, the, the color sketch in the far lower right, and then the image of that sort of bedroom scene in the lower center um, image. Those are both by a, a, um, a married 
couple performing their heteronormativity, although in real life they were not. Um, uh, so that's, that, that's a married couple, uh, Ru Russell and, and Mary Wright. And then Mary Brandt is the two funny cartoons of, again, a family kind of living in their house. Then George Nelson, um, who we've already met, uh, is represented by the photograph in the dining room um, above, uh, rendering above him. Um, so in the white, so all of these white artists describe modernism as a style that is meant to distinguish the reader. It's a, they all say that modernism is a style that you've got to, you've got to sort of show your commitment to it. It's sort of, you know, you've got to stand up and just really sort of, you know, commit yourself to modernism. Paul Williams is represented by the two greenish tinted renderings on either side of the screen. He was the first African-American architect elected to the American Institute of Architects. And he alone is um, among these writers. He alone suggests that modernism, rather than being a divisive thing that you've got to sort of like demonstrate your commitment to it. Rather, modernism could be understood as one style among many. It's a style that might appeal to a lot of people, um, but you know, his, his whole attitude is one of inclusivity rather than creating divisions. So dividing and segregating out through sort of your commitment to modernism is the style of the, is the rhetorical strategy of the white authors and is not the strategy of Williams. Um, and indeed throughout Williams's text, the reader repeatedly encounters language that connects modernism and interior design with freedom how to design your home and its spaces to maximize the freedom of movement. And that's very different from this rhetoric of, of exclusion and needing to kind of show your commitment and sort of as if modernism requires all this hard work. Uh, so anyway, Williams is only one voice, but I was very interested in this idea that, um, that his approach to modernism represented a very different approach from all of these white modernists. And in my book, I suggest that he might be connected to a larger counter narrative about modernism in the mid century United States. It's a counter narrative that's anchored around black voices and black lives that presents a set of values that differs from the modernism of white designers and architects and um, advertisers. And that this counter modernism is not one that has received the, as, is not as well known, and that rather the white modernism is the one that we have inherited today. So I trace this counter narrative in an exploration of another example of print culture from the period uh, in, my, in chapter two um, in a deep sort of study of modernism in Ebony and Life magazines. And what I found when I looked at these two publications is it's not so much that modernism is totally different between the two magazines, but rather that the points of emphasis in each are different and are meaningful in their difference. Uh, there's more emphasis on control, cleanliness, and defensive exclusion in life's modernism, and more emphasis on bodily comfort and economic agency in Ebony's modernism. And I'm representing this in these two images on the left-hand side of the screen here with the rich e reach easy cleaning from life and the modern design you bet from Ebony um, below it. Um, Ebony and Life also profiled designers uh, and those who created modernist works of art and architecture. And I think we can see the same tone and points of emphasis in these discussions as well. So Ad Bates is a, a, a black designer, furniture designer who was profiled in Ebony. And there's a, this is a portrait of him in the upper um, center part of the screen. And he is shown at work in his studio sanding this, these large austere plants of wood that might become part of something like this, this coffee table in the lower center image. Um, and what's so interesting about this coffee table is that it's designed clearly for the comfort of the user. It's designed so that you're, it comes with these cushions so that you put your feet up on it, which is how everybody wants to use a coffee table, actually. It's not a misuse of the table. The table is designed 
for your comfort. Um, in contrast, Charles Eames, the uber famous designer, everybody knows whose name everyone knows, Charles Eames is profiled in life at around the same time. And Eames is shown, you know, without any, he's pure intellect, no sort of bodily agency. Um, to the extent that he's doing any work at all, he's sort of pinning these tumbleweeds <laughs> to the wall. Um, and he's literally transformed into an abstract work of art um, next to sort of this abstract design in his house. Um, so um, I, I could go on and sort of go on. Um, but anyway, what I would say is that modernism is coded with signifiers of control, exclusion, which equal whiteness in life. Uh, but it becomes a tool of agency and social empowerment for African Americans in ebony. Um, and so mid-century modernism is really not about whiteness always in short. What's interesting is that its symbolic value is quite different depending on the audience. And this means that its history and legacy have multiple strands. And that complexity is something that I would really like to uh, embrace and to build into um, a larger historical conversation. So I'd like to leave it there. Yeah. Thank you. my mic on for me sitting here? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, I, I suddenly realized that if we do not <coughs> have microphones for the audience, then it might be difficult for people to, uh, to uh, hear you who are online. So I don't know if that's possible um, as we sort of go through. I wanted to ask a few questions to gauge a little bit of a conversation um, and then allow, or allow Professor should we you next? Yeah, let's, let's Okay, let's let her go next. Okay. And then we'll have a conversation. Then we'll have a conversation. Yeah. I was thinking, I was worried that these slides, we'll have to like jump back and forth between both <laughs> pictures. Oh, power, see power, that? Power, Accomplished. Power, power. Yeah. Professor Bachu. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it looks lethal. Welcome, my friends, all those from Clark and all those who are watching us from outside, and also to my Clark colleagues. It's wonderful to be here. So what I wanted to do in my talk is going to divide it into three parts. I'm going to talk firstly about this notion of multiple migrants, which is very significant in my work. And then I will talk about what makes them particularly innovative. And I'm going to talk about movement capital, a capital that's very powerful, that is anti-fragile, has those properties, and is also very adaptable, and particularly suitable to life of uncertainty and living in dissonant terrains. Finally, I want to talk about what the origins of these capital are, this capital is, and that is to do with pioneering cultures, which are not so different from early pioneering cultures in the US. But let me start off by posing a question and the question is, why? Why are these people particularly innovative? We know it's common knowledge that immigrants are some of the most innovative people. They hold the most number of patents. 54% uh, of people with new uh, companies that are over a billion. So that is a phenomenon, an immigrant phenomenon that's very well known. But these people within this group are hyper innovators and, the, and a lot of them are multiple migrants. And the people I'm going to talk about, the group that I write about are racialized. Race is central to their everyday experience, to their marginality. So I want to assume that you take that for granted. It's, uh, it's something that defines their lives. So some of you know that you know some of the people I'm going to talk about who, not in my case, but generally who are multiple migrants. The, vac the vaccine for coronavirus is essentially a multiple migrant phenomenon. Nubar Afyan, the CEO of flagship pioneering behind the Moderna vaccine, is an Armenian multiple migrant from Beirut in Lebanon, where he was raised, to Montreal, to MIT, Cambridge here. He says that his lived experience as a multiple migrant underpins his ability to innovate. He says, my God, there's so little light here. 
uprooting, rerouting, I think are very much the core of what innovation is about. I have come to think over the few years that innovation is a form of intellectual migration, immigration. You have to kind of escape the intellectual gravity and be able to, to look, the, look at the other side and ask if there is another reality. And he says, you know, he says that innovation is an intellectual migration. He says, when you leave the comforts of what you know, expose yourself to criticism, go to something that people don't believe is possible, persist, persist, and persist until you make it habitable so that people come and tell you how obvious it was. That really defines the people I write about. At every stage, they're working against the odds. In fact, sometimes they're told like one of the cases I'll talk about, Satyajinder, that the uh, initiation of the Large Hadron Collider was a project of madness. So you also know, you know about Nubarafian. The Moderna, the Pfizer vaccine, the two Turkish doctors based in Germany, um, you know, wonderful scientists, a remarkable a couple, their company BioNTech is behind Pfizer. Then... Patrick Sunshon has a similar kind of biography to my, uh, to my own. He's a Hakka Chinese from North Africa to Vancouver to UCLA. He's working on a, um, a booster shot that is supposed to be able to deal with variants. It's in its final stages. He is a medic, a scientist. He's owner of LA Times, a billionaire. Nikola Tesla, my favorite, who you know, who has a movement craft trajectory, he goes from Croatia to Austria to Hungary to Paris, finally to New York, honing his skills with each migration. His father is a craftsman, and this craft expertise defines the group I write about. Elon Musk, much in the news for 45 billion purchase of Twitter. He is from South Africa to Montreal to Stanford, California is his base. Walter Gropius, you know, connected with the world of design, the design guru, the founding father of Bauhaus, the man who built Bauhaus. In fact, they say Bauhaus reshaped the world. And according to Fiona McCarthy, his biographer, his migration, Bauhaus was already known. It was preeminent. But his migration to the U.S. made it, along with his colleague, Mies von der Hoa, a, a, a much more powerful movement, and Croft was central to Bauhaus teaching. And most of these men are white men, except for Petrus Sunshong. So what is movement capital? Uh, what is it? It is capital that has agility, that has plasticity. It encodes the ability to discover the new on the basis of the new, without paying attention to status quo and conventions. It is a sophisticated expertise to start it. Its origins are in the building of the infrastructure of communities in new lands from scratch. It is accrued in the diaspora, a migrant movement phenomenon. It's a combination of migration and maker capital skills that are social, cultural, and technical. And it's enormously collaborative and distributive, particularly suitable to some of the digital technologies of our times. Resilience is a central characteristic, the ability to negotiate dissonance and disequilibrium, which is what a lot of us are going through. But this is part of the everyday existence. It's a taken for granted way of working. It is to be expected. They're racialized, as I've said in a way, in an everyday kind of way. So the characteristics that emanate from movement capital, you know, which is moving across international borders and living in disequilibrium of having to navigate landscapes, of groping to find your way, is a central characteristic of this movement capital. Resilience is central to it, an anti-fragile capability. Uh, Andrew Zoli says that pyramids are very strong but when pyramids crash, you cannot rebuild them. Resilience capital, movement capital, has enormous adaptability. This combined with technical expertise, you know, craft expertise, which is central to the people I'm writing about, 
it is actually the, also the ancient inheritance that some of them are part of the north, of North India, where the Harappan civilization was. They developed metallurgy, irrigation, so on, one of the powerful civilizations. So the ability to deal with dissonance and disequilibrium is you know, a routine way of life. So I want to, uh, and they also, it gives you the ability to create in a daring way, in a way of discovering parts that were not obvious and were not necessarily known in advance. So I want to talk, I'm going to refer to three cases which demonstrate some of the points that I'm making. One, you know, these are people who are, have engaged in path-breaking creativity, you know, also breaking knowledge hierarchies. There's a, they have, there is a democratizing impulse within this group. So, so Tijinda Virdi, could we bring up the first slide of Tijinda Virdi, please? So he is the person behind the founding, the, one of the five founding fathers of the Large Hadron Collider. And there were two uh, particle accelerators. The one he led uh, was one where there were the clearest results for the God particle, Higgs boson. This is an experiment in extreme engineering. It is based in CERN, the European Organization of Nuclear Research, a 5.5 billion particle accelerator which hurtles protons just below the speed of light in a 27 kilometer circular tunnel underneath the French Swiss border. The two particle investigators, Atlas and CMS, uh, these are the ones, these are big experiments. So it's the Large Hadron uh, Collider is considered to be a cathedral to science. Um, and it is the most daring scientific experiment ever done. It's the most complex instrument ever made. So this Tejinder, the son of a craftsman who is a multiple migrant, is one of the founding fathers. He says when they started this experiment, which involved 45 countries, 3,000 scientists and personnel, that they were told that they were mad. It was not going to be possible. But yet he, he along with these four other people, started this experiment. His role was critical because it needed these scintillating tungsten crystals, which only the expertise, there were others, but the expertise was in Russia. It took more than 10 years to get these crystals built for a calorimeter which he fought for, and that is a chlorometer which showed the clearest results for the Higgs boson, which is, of course, very big news. He's won every prize in physics, and the Queen knighted him a few years ago. Next, Amarjit Kalsi, an architect who died whilst I was writing this book. He is behind some of the iconic buildings in Europe. His ability to capture the new in the moment is absolutely powerful. He was, he, they said that he had magical abilities to draw, you know, behind the landmark products. When he drew a sketch in during a conversation, that sketch was essentially how the building turned out. So he's called a lyrical architect, a virtuoso draftsman, whose draftsman was extraordinary. The force behind Heathrow Terminal 5, the European Court of Human Rights, in France, Strasbourg, the law court in Bordeaux, Capitagino Transport Hub in Naples, Baraja Airport in Madrid, and many more. It's also a furniture designer, etc. This is the notion, the ability to capture the new in a sketch, in the moment, as the moment is being discovered, as it unfolds itself, is a centrally powerful characteristic of multiple migrants. And so he used a simple rotary pen to make the drawings. And, you know, so in the primal moment when a new idea is being discussed, that primal moment captures, uh, he captured what was going to be the, uh, what turned out to be the final drawing. So the first, you see this very complex drawing, the first one, he did this when he was 20 years old and he's at the prestigious architectural association, um, you know, the, the premier, institution and he's flailing he's fearing he's, there's enormous racism against him and there are others but richard rogers who comes from one of the most uh, 
preeminent firms, you know, uh, uh, they won the Pritzker, Pritzker Award, so on. So he notices, I mean, the, the tutors are not helping him. This is the 1970s. And he, the only people who help each other are the ones who are on the margins. They're also people of color. And his drawing is so exquisite, Richard Rogers invites him to join his firm. And he says, that's a miracle. That generation of Asians who emerged, it was because uh, something amazing happened. Some angel uh, intervened. And then he went on at the age of 30 to win major grants and uh, uh, won many contracts from Europe along with his partner, Ivan Harbour, but racism defined him. When he was in school, they, they were told to play football and so on. I mean, this is a, a facet of my generation. But the key point is that he had, the, he had a powerful sensibility that is a facet of movement capital, that is in creativity that is not based on old secrets, on conventions or established classificatory systems, but on the basis of the new, of finding the new. Finally, Sunit Tuli, who is a serial entrepreneur. Could we have the next slide? These are Amarjit's designs. Sunit Tuli is a serial technolo technology entrepreneur, and he is governed by the ideology that you do good to everyone. He's also uh, his religious and cultural background, which really emphasizes this notion of sarbat dappala, which is that you think of good for everyone, that you, you, you share your resources. Uh, I'll talk about that in the next section. He's a visionary philanthropist named 15 uh, most powerful educational entrepreneurs by Forbes magazine. And so he uh, invented a $50 handheld device, which does all the things that the iPad does, but does not look so good. It's not so beautifully made. And so he is often asked, um, if he's trying to break Steve Jobs' monopoly, whenever I've been at press conferences with him, he's always inundated with that question. And he says he is not interested in Steve Jobs' um, monopoly because very few people in the world can afford a four to $600 iPad, but he, many people can afford a $50 iPad. So the, com the problem for him was they thought they made this, uh, this device, very few people would want it. But instead of being a graded scaled market, it went you know, right to the top, they had production issues. But the point is that he's a democratizer. He is, wants you know, the world to have the world to have um, uh, to have access to computing power, and and this notion that uh, that the technology that knowledge should be accessible to people is fundamentally behind this radical generosity that multiple migrants um, uh, uh, embody and encode, and it's related to the notion of shareism which is a modern notion developed by the Free Souls Movement, by Lawrence Lessig, uh, about open source technologies. So what I'm suggesting is that these people who built the infrastructure of communities uh, in the diaspora, that their, their sensibilities were that of crowdsourcing, of building a creative commons, of sharing their resources. They combine technical expertise with deeply rooted aesthetics of sharing, of collaboration, of, uh, you know, which is a defining feature of their, the ways in which they operated. So, uh, and that notion, which is ancient for the kind of groups that are, uh, people that Sunit Tuli belongs to, is, uh, is absolutely in sync with the currents of our times, which is about open source, about, light, uh, about free licensing, this notion of shareism developed by Isaac Mao, uh, who is a venture capitalist, who says that shareism is a re mind revolution, that the more you share, the more social capital you accrue. So it's a notion of democrat democratizing. It's the opposite of elite capital, capital which is often hoarded, by Brahmins, by Brahmin-like people. So finally, um, I want to just refer to another mover and maker, as I've been watching um, um, the biography by Ken Burns of Benjamin Franklin. I've been much interested in him. And this is what, uh, you know, do you know that Benjamin Franklin 
spent 15 years in London, nine years in Paris, and he worked with the Lunar Men, these industrialists who led the Industrial Revolution, Charles Darwin's father, Josiah Wedwood, the people uh, who, um, uh, you know, who uh, were behind many industrial inventions, which actually catalyzed the Industrial Revolution. He's a grandson of a blacksmith, son of a candle maker, also has a craft migration trajectory. He says, and he, like these people who I'm writing about, shares his knowledge. He's anti-patents and in, a, in the same way that the people I write about. He says, we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others. We would be glad of the opportunity to serve others by our inventions and we should do this freely and generously. So I will end here. My three points were why you know, immigrants are already very innovative. What is it about multiple migrants that makes them hyper innovative? I say that it is to do with movement capital and movement capital, which, in, which is, can deal with dissonance and disequilibrium and a capital which is also very open. It has radical openness. I wanted to finish with the final image, which is corrugated iron temples. When I started my work 10 years or more than that, my friend Les Back said that you have to tell the story of gated iron temples, which were around in many diasporic contexts, certainly in my grandfather's time. And he said, you have to tell the story because in this story is the notion that you had to build the infrastructure of the community. You had to share, you had to deal with scarce resources. You had to crowdsource. And that aesthetic, that sensibility is being played out in the 21st century by the progeny of those kids in some of the most powerful landscapes of building, of science, of culture, and so on and so forth. So those were my three points, my friends. Thank you. All right, I'll pass it to Anita for the first series of questions. Thank you so much. Uh, I can see so many wonderful connections between the projects that um, you, Christina, and Parminder have shared with us today. And I thought I would start off just a, a conversation before we take some questions from the audience um, to ask you, you know, both of your, your projects uh, talk about counter narratives uh, to the kind of dominant thinking about design and innovation. And I wonder if you could tell us a little bit, each of you broadly, what do they help us understand about race, gender, and ethnicity in the 21st century? Small question. <laughs> what sorts of, le you know, what does this lens help us understand about where we're, where we are and where we're going? So I think, I think what is so significant to me is that so many of the issues that are faced by our great grandparents and our grandparents are, are come up again and again. And I think of this notion that Leroy Jones developed, that Paul Gilroy, both a British, black, African-American scholars say, refer to it as the changing same. It's essentially the same thing, the same forces that seem to change very little. You assume that if you acquire education and other kinds of social power, that these dynamics might change. As you, as you remember, Barack Obama had to apologize to a policeman because he supported Skip Gates and because a policeman came to his house and said, didn't really believe that that was his house. So what is so striking to some of us uh, my own experience, my grandparents, you know, we're always in, in a minority context and we are people of color. And in my case, they're people who wear turbans and turbans are very hard fought for. You stick out like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, you know, yet these are the people who have changed the laws in Britain, went to the Supreme Court and to the European courts that the Sikhs were allowed to wear a turban. They don't wear, they wear, they wear a turban when they ride a motorbike. And so uh, one of the things that I say about movement capital, when I talk, uh, do more talks on multiple migrations, is the ability to, uh, uh, this very sophisticated management of their minority status. And the more they're abroad, the more skilled they are. You know, they have lawyers and they have Queen's councils and, and so on and so forth. So they have really fought for their right to be 
themselves in a very racialized world in, in which much goes against them. In fact, one of the things that's, the, that's powerful about movement capital is that you expect from age zero that things are going to go against you and you somehow have to find a space within those difficult racialized spaces. And it's not going to get easy just because you become a powerful intellectual or a rich person or so on and so forth. Thanks. Well, I think I, I guess I would say that for me, sense is uh, that there's a, to think about like furniture, it doesn't seem it, seems, it seems like a very different world in a way from the life stories that you're talking about. But to the extent that we all look at these consumer products as things that we acquire because we're buying a story of self-fashioning and that uh, the history of what these objects were is actually much more rich and varied and uh, and complex and where his and what history has done to these objects over the last 70 years is really reduced it to this very narrow scope and so I, there's I, so part of for me part of what I want with this project is a sense of um, opening up the plurality and complexity of and, and diversity of what the historical moment in the decades right after the war was and the sense of the multiple ways that modernism was valued and what it meant because I feel like that changes what we can understand for um, how we think of ourselves and this and and how we think of the possibilities of self-fashioning now and that also changes what we can understand also in the industry and for practitioners now and in the future and that's a really big thing because the design industry is still overwhelmingly white um, although there's a lot of movement to try to change that and Herman Miller is a leader in that now um, but there's there's still a huge amount of work to do so I feel like opening up this past uh, creates, changing how you understand the past creates possibilities for really changing the future. <clears throat> I actually um, had a thank you to, by the way, for those wonderful responses. Um, I'm intrigued by actually similarities in the, in the work. Um, particularly, I'm interested in sort of the, the, the approaches that, that both of you take in it and you know, Christina, I think you've under, undersold uh, uh, the story in this wonderful book about the ways in which people like Johnson of Ebony have to sort of consider the movement of, of ideas, right, about what blackness is in this more commercial space and how they have to, he has to fight uh, other people who are trying to define it. And they're unsure, they're unsure about where Ebony fits in relation to life. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wondered if you could maybe talk about the sort of this idea of movement and migration of ideas, right? And how they, they're translated and changed from one work to the other, because that's sort of an important part. And when you have to push back and say that, no, actually, this actually seems, seems, seems appropriate in Ebony, um, even if people who have more power, uh, you know, um, um, don't necessarily think that's the case. Uh, so, um, so can you tell me a little bit more? Or I'm not quite sure. I guess I'm just thinking about sort of the, the, you know, you have, you know, editors, artists who are trying to imagine a sort of more mainstream scene. And, and yeah. so the designs are going to reflect the tension, right, between how they imagine African-American potential consumers will see things, yeah. um, uh, you know, as opposed to others who are uncertain, right, uh, who are the editors and the decision makers of life. Um, and so I just wondered about the sort of tensions between this sort of idea of like what will work yeah, in one particular magazine in terms of visual culture yeah. um, and, and what they have to push back when other people say, oh, I don't think that's going to work. Like, no, no, this is going to work. This is this imagery, this approach, this angle. Right, right. Well, that that's a really, that's a great question. And I, and I have to confess that there's, what I'm working with is the evidence of what appears in the magazine. So I think that, um, 
what what's clear is that in Life magazine, the mm. presumed imagined audience is white. Mm -hmm. And that's and so even though there is a multiracial audience reading life, the presumed imagined audience of the editorial board and the advertisers and all of that is white. And the translations or some cases translations and then really but just the world that is created in the pages of Ebony magazine is ultimately is ultimately distinctive and and complex and there's multiple there are there are multiple stories being told within mm -hmm. the magazine so i think one of the things i would say is that um in ebony what i found is that there's not a there's not a coherent voice mm -hmm. i mean if you think of the magazine itself as an archive mm -hmm. what's actually fascinating is that uh and this is something that i tried to tease out in my book and it's obviously not something that i can like present here in 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever but that there are there are moments where uh an articulated sense of a distinctive black embrace and interpretation of modernism. Mm -hmm. There are moments when that is very present, but there are also moments when it's really, it really seems like it's mirroring what's going on in life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's where it's almost like the magazine is copying Life magazine. Mm -hmm. And so, so those are two different voices that are literally intertwining and crisscrossing each other, sometimes within one issue of the magazine. Mm -hmm. So what I read that as is, um, is I don't know if it's disagreement mm -hmm. or if it's just plurality in the editorial and advertising you know, approach mm -hmm. of the journal, of the magazine. Yeah, and I'm, I think a lot about sort of how in that, in this particular moment, the idea of audiences, right? And sort of, I'm thinking about Coca-Cola and other sort of mm -hmm. ad companies that begin to take on and risk sort of having African-Americans in their advertisements mm -hmm. and how they, you know, imagine, is this just for a black audience or is this potentially an audience that is broader, right? Yep. Than, than yep. just who they're advertising to. And so I think yep. the interplay between, you know, these two particular magazines, I thought, is, is fascinating because it's at a sort of beginning moment when there's the possibility of both. Yes. Um, yeah. And this actually brings me to this question of these movers in, in terms of thinking about when they arrive at a different location. And I wondered, Parmen, if you could talk a bit about, because you talk about the, the, the sort of having to negotiate and be resilient. I wondered if there, if you find sort of in your research that the creators also have to confront people who don't understand how potentially significant I'm talking about funders, right, for fellowships and things. And, you know, when you have to fashion yourself for an audience of people who are going to fund your project, right? You know, do they talk about the sort of that, that challenge of translation to new audiences, particularly when they, when they arrive in, say, Britain, for example? Can you think of any examples of that and how power plays into it? Well, you know, I didn't talk about the artists in my, uh, in my book. Mm. Uh, Pajan Hunjan is one. She does public art because... Now, galleries, which are controlled by such classical, um, very established values, just do not appreciate what they are doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, they work in domains that are outside that. You know, I mean, this is, it is also their power, and there's a price to be paid. I also wrote about the Singh twins, who have, who have contemporized Mughal, the miniature Mughal paintings, and made them very British Asian. They have had a lifetime. I don't know how they are standing where their, 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 uh, their teachers said that this was degenerate art, that it was not art. And they're saying, well, look at Picasso and all these people who were influenced by Africa, by Tahiti, by, and you're telling us that we can't work with, uh, uh, with Mughal paintings. They're very impressed uh, that these are very complex, beautifully uh, made paintings, you know, and India doesn't appreciate them. And, and so now Simon Sharma, Nina Kushner's uh, uh, PhD supervisor, uh, has done this wonderful documentary, which he says they are the new face of uh, artistic face of Britain. Mm -hmm. But it has meant there has been a lifetime. The, it's like, it's not one thing, it's their rejection of their PhD. They, but they're so assertive. You know, they have this sort of fuck you attitude. We are going to go and do whatever we want to do. And they have been, and now as they say, they become, you know, the artistic face, the new artistic face of Britain. So it is, 
it's it is a, a, a life experience that you expect. My brother-in-law is in the world of design. My, my brother is in the world of design. He was told by the Royal College of Art that Sikhs with turbans should be in the British Army, not in the glamorous world of fashion and design. Yeah. And so there's a lot of damage. But the in, interest, interesting thing also is that they do not work in spaces that are already there. It's, you know, David Fithian's, President Fithian's point of view that you discover the culture of possibility. So the notion, you know, Basil Bernstein's notion that you discover at the moment as it happens, it really ignores existing sacreds, existing systems of classification. Mm -hmm. And they're very good democratizers. So one of the musicians I wrote about, he actually believes that the ways in which um, he's, he has invented a, a, the tabla, you know, the Indian drums, uh, an instrument. And he's also written, because Indian music is improvisational, it's not written down, and that he has actually uh, made a standard score so that anybody can play the tabla. And he does this because he hates the fact that capital, musical capital, is monopolized by certain groups, by guild-like organizations. Mm -hmm. And so this notion that you break knowledge hierarchies, they're not elites, they don't belong to power elites, they're marginal, they're people of color. And therefore this, their discovery of the new, as I, as I said, that the most daring scientific experiment, the most complex instrument ever made mm -hmm. is from this group. When they were told for many years, these people are mad, you will not be able to be make the Large Hadron Collider, and therefore we would not know what the God particle is. That theme applies to practically mm -hmm. everyone that I write about. So, you know, so there is a mainstream, but they're also, they enter it to mm -hmm. abolish it. And, and I think shareism, that notion I talk about, borrowing Isaac Mao's notion, uh, it, it's something that is part of a deep, DNA, if I could use an eugenics phrase, you know, that it is. And the other thing that's very interesting is they say that they can take higher levels of risk because what was a surprise to me is that they so admire their great-grandparents and their grandparents who moved, who took a risk. They could hardly speak English. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and people like my grandfather, and it's a common story within these multiple migrants, goes from India, probably at the age of 60, to Shanghai, from Shanghai mm -hmm. to Yokohama, learns Japanese woodwork techniques from Yokohama to Malaysia, Malaysia to Basra in Iraq. Then he goes to Kenya. Mm -hmm. And so that, that trajectory already, like, there's something about you, a mindset that allows you to take a risk because you know you can take a risk. Other people did it with with far fewer resources and credentials. Okay. Well, we still have three minutes to have questions, and we all can find my colleagues' emails for more extensive, complex questions um, that they'll answer. But um, I don't know if we have a microphone for here, and there was going – oh, there it is. So, uh, yeah, the, the floor is here for Lise One, Professor Tenenbaum. Thank you. It was really, really wonderful, and it just, it's, um, we don't do this enough, and it's just wonderful to hear my colleagues, about my colleagues' works and the questions posed by my colleagues. But women, I mean, Christina, you talked about women as objects, but in, for both of your research, what about women as makers, uh, whether it be design or in terms of other innovations? So Wilson, you want to go first? So, do you want to go first? Or should I go first? Um, we have two minutes, so we'll I keep it I will just say pithy. briefly, I did not, um, I talked, I, I worked on one designer um, in my book, I believe, um, uh, Frida Diamond, who uh, has a fascinating life as a uh, radical communist. Um, her mother was very good friends with Emma Goldman, and uh, she uh, was an extremely accomplished furniture designer, but also a glassware designer for Libby Glass. And so a lot of those decal glasses that you remember from the 1950s mm. are all designed, a lot of them are designed by her. Um, so I did talk about her, but the 1950s was a very, very tough time for women in the design field. So there are very few, uh, and they were mostly... For objects, they were most they were mostly white women. Um, there was some textile design, 
by black women, but um, not a lot. Uh, and because of the structure of my book, I only ended up talking about Frida Diamond. Um, but that's a great call out. So, Shelley, I had actually thought of, uh, that I'm talking about these men, and literally because I was trying to stick to 10 minutes, just as we came on, I got the slides cut from that. So women are central to my book. A product designer, uh, a person who has enormous material, daring, Pajan Hunjan, who designed one of the pontoons for the Olympics, and many other uh, uh, rendering of a creativity done by engineering firms and architectural firms. And then I also wrote about Jasleen, who is a product designer, and you see her things in department stores, and she's also has all these uh, um, characteristics of sharing her work and um, and breaking into the monopolies of Royal College of Art. You know, whenever uh, she'll do tea stand, what she's interested in is in the moment. She's a bit like the uh, Dadaist that you create these moments where people come together. So in my book, Women Are Central, but in my 10 minute talk, I literally made a decision two minutes before I started talking that I just stick to these, to stick to my 10 minute format. So uh, I'm very interested in women. And in fact, I move on to work more centrally with women and technical capital. The reason women are very powerful in the diaspora in terms of technical capital is the same, is the same you know, I love the image of Barbara Stanwyck in one of her films, uh, writing uh, what looks like a, combine harvester and that notion of driving trucks and and using lace machines was very powerful in the diaspora where the sexual division of labor was fluid and it had to be in pioneering context mm -hmm. women did many things that they did not do in countries of origin and this is why their daughters are into using engineering and architectural firms and so on so i uh, my next project is on technical capital that emerges from pioneering cultures, which is defining the world. Most of what I, the central point of my book is that this capital, which is defining our built environment and is making such an impact in, on the world, is invisible to the world. People mm -hmm. do not think of multiple migrants. And yet, as I read about Benjamin Franklin, inventor of so many, the bifocals, light, electric lightning, blah, blah, I mean, the, the rod, and so on, I see that, and I also, when I did the seminar with Christine, that craft without, we can talk about the American Constitution, but without craftsmen who came here, the infrastructure of the US would not be in place. Mm. And therefore, they're so significant in the same way that the group I write about. So when I found out uh, Benjamin Franklin is the son of a blacksmith, I thought, oh, just like my family, <laughs> well, fur furniture makers and blacksmiths and so on. And indeed, the Gutenberg press was developed by blacksmiths. The print revolution would not have taken place. And we learned from Glenn Adamson's work that without craft, without the technical knowledge, you know, there would be no constitution, full stop. Speaking of, since you mentioned your future projects, Professor Wilson, tell everybody about uh, some of the stuff you're working on now and, and what's exciting to come. Yeah, some of the designers who <coughs> were profiled in Ebony, um, I, I'm working on expanding uh, their stories and trying to write a maybe a collective biography of some of them who were, mm -hmm. appeared in Ebony. Um, and the thing that's very interesting is that a lot of these uh, these are men who were profiled in Ebony, um, have these very interesting, appear to have these moments of very successful careers. And yet I, it's uh, undoubtedly a combination of structural racism that prevents them perhaps from having as long going successful careers, uh, but also just the limits of what is knowable about the various phases of their careers. So yesterday I was out looking at the archive of one of these men whose mother was a famous sculptor, mm -hmm. Mita Warwick Fuller, um, of, course. Yeah. of course. So her son was an interesting designer, but mm. him, his work is very hard to come by. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so that's what I'm do working on next. All right. So. Any last words? I, I, I think that um, in, in we're all looking at refugees now in the world. Um, I mean, the, it's a very uh, 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 prominent topic. And, you know, Hannah Arendt was talking about refugees as vanguard. And I think that's something also to think about. It Rather, only thinking about helping 
you know, diff people in difficult circumstances. I really think that we can learn from the work of Parminder and Christina and think about these, um, these newcomers, new people who bring with them ideas, different uh, experiences, uh, making new opportunities. So I really think that um, it sort of ties a lot of what you've been talking about together in the current circumstances. So thank you, Osman, and thanks everybody who came uh, to hear our two uh, colleagues today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the rest of the um, activities, and uh, we're very, very um, happy that you came. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so at one, so about eh, 25 minutes, we'll get started with the next panel. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to, to come to that, and those who are online, um, yeah, stick around, log back in at one, and we'll get started with the next panel. Thank you.